Megan. Okay, we are broadcasting. And Catherine, you should be able to control the screen now. Everyone, we are about a minute up, but I see everyone rolling in. We're going to wait another minute just so everybody knows you are automatically muted and we will go over everything from how you ask questions to how today is going to flow in about two minutes. All right, I know we are right at one o'clock and we have a packed presentation today, but I do see everyone rolling in somewhat slowly. We're getting a big groups at a time. Um, I feel like we should always have entrance music for these just so people know <laughs> we're on. Um, let me give everyone one more minute to roll in because I keep seeing those numbers jump and then we'll go ahead and get started. Oh, Cindy, 7 a.m. in Hawaii. I saw that. You are quite dedicated. My goodness. All right, we will get started. I will trust everyone who can hear my voice now to fill in any of our latecomers if you see questions on the chat. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good morning to our friends on the West Coast and, and a very early good morning to those in Hawaii. Thank you so much for joining us for Victim Services During the Pandemic, Experiences of Grief and Loss. We have one very important announcement. I ask that you excuse us because it's a bit of an infomercial, to be honest. Um, this year, NCBC has decided that the National Training Institute, which was scheduled to take place in Atlanta, will instead be completely virtual. This is actually really exciting for us. Um, we think it'll allow a lot of folks who may not normally be able to attend due to travel restrict restrictions to actually join us. It's also the first time that any attendees and all attendees will have access to every single session we offer, which is over 80 sessions. Um, you'll be receiving a USB flash drive if you sign up and that will have all of the presentations. So, so there are some really exciting moments um, despite what we thought initially was a setback. 
Right now you'll see the slide, we're offering a flash sale which has $25 off of registration fees, which we've already drastically reduced because we're going virtual. Um, but for the next week, if you sign up now, it'll be an extra 25% off. Um, you see all the information in the slide. That is the link to go to. We really hope you'll consider joining us, especially if you've never been able to attend an NTI in the past. We bring about 800 people together and, and we share a lot of really valuable information. And we still have a few surprises up our sleeve for this year, even though we're virtual. So we hope you'll join us. With that, we will now return to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, experiencing grief and loss amidst the pandemic. We, we really thought this was a crucial seminar to hold at this time because vicarious trauma has become much, much more profound throughout the pandemic and through quarantining and through this isolation that we're feeling. And we're noticing that trend very much on our Facebook page and, and really seeing that, that even as service providers, we're, we're struggling with how to deal with grief amidst the pandemic. So joining us is Catherine Manners. She is a senior partner at Resilience Work, which provides training and technical assistance and consultation to victim services, law enforcement, legal, and crisis responder programs. Catherine has more than 30 years of direct service experience and supervision in victim services. Additionally, she provides organizational consul consulting and training on topics of trauma in, oh gosh, I'm struggling this morning, self-care and vicarious trauma. She's the co-founder and author of a program that provides information and support to direct service advocates on secondary traumatic stress, organizational development, and self-care, and she provides crisis intervention training and counseling. You'll notice on your invitations this time, we asked you to answer a few questions in advance, and Catherine's going to make sure that she discusses those throughout the webinar. We're going to leave the chat function open. I know everybody likes to, to chat with each other, so please continue to have conversations with each other on there. But no, we are not going to be answering questions from the chat. Any questions we answer will have to come through that Q&A function. If you hover down near the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a button that says Q&A. If you click that and ask the question, we will try to get to it now. Any questions that we don't get to in this time, what we're going to do is provide them to Catherine. She's going to type out her answer and then we'll distribute all of the answers within an email um, within the next couple of days. So we will make sure that everything gets answered and that you have access to that. With all of that, I'm going to turn this over to Catherine. So welcome Catherine and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, and, and hello, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. It's, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm gonna see if I can manage to move these slides, and I can, hooray. Okay, um, <clears throat> so um, I'm, I'm really happy to be tackling this topic today. Um, it, you know, the, the idea of all the losses that people are experiencing because of COVID, um, just on top of every other kind of loss that we deal with on a daily basis through our work can be quite overwhelming. Um, so I'm really glad you're here today and I'm hoping, um, and I love the idea that the chat is open and that you guys are gonna be talking to each other because you know better than anyone else how important peer support is, how important it is to be connected to people. Um, and, uh, and this is a tremendous opportunity to be you know, chatting with your, with your colleagues out there around the world. Um, so I have uh, left my partner's um, name on there, Lisa Teason, with whom I had prepared to do this uh, presentation with, but she, she actually um, was, was doing some self-care and took herself out on a bicycle and uh, went for a nice bike ride and then actually uh, had a little accident and so is, is recovering at home and, and uh, so I'm going to be doing this solo. But I uh, just wanted to give her some credit where credit is due. So, um, oh, well, let me just go back and just as part of my intro, um, as if our job wasn't challenging enough, um, we, have, we now have this uh, COVID to, to deal with. And I am just gonna mute, stop my video and disappear. So, um, this is a critical time for victim and survivors that we work with. Their access to supports and services to keep them safe is an additional life or death circumstance that weighs heavy on our minds. And many of us feel an increase in helplessness as services are increasingly limited and we grow more concerned by the day. 
In addition, we are experiencing the, per the personal and professional challenges that our clients and our coworkers are experiencing as well. Some of us may have family, friends, community members, coworkers, or clients who have the virus, and we send our deepest condolences to any of you who are mourning the loss of a loved one or any others in your life. All of us here are lucky in one thing though. We are all employed, we have internet access, and time to attend a training. Most of us are attempting to work from home in less than professional circumstances with roommates, children, pets, all vying for our space, time, and attention. Less than perfect connectivity or computer capability and having to make do without our usual supports and resources at our fingertips. All the while, managing the flow of alarming and confusing directives and differences in interpretation of stay-at-home orders and social distancing. And then, of course, there's Zoom exhaustion. I think it goes without saying that our emotions are all on a roller coaster. We may be feeling concern, fear, helplessness about the safety of clients or our families or ourselves. Their past trauma and our own past traumas may be getting triggered at this time. Perhaps we've lost a sense of effectiveness that, you know, that we can't do our job in the way that we used to. And that can make us feel guilty about the lack of equality in responses and access to resources we may have once had. We can get angry at others' responses to safety measures or in general about how this crisis is being handled. We can feel almost frozen in time. So many things are on hold. Relationships are on hold, vacations, events, moves, or our jobs, in fact. Maintaining hopefulness becomes a real challenge. And at times we can feel numb or bored or depressed. We may despair about the future, our own future. We may despair about the future of our children. But oftentimes we're calm. And why would that be? I think we're calm because we are experts in crisis response. We know about how to do this stuff. We know about how to respond to crisis. But then we're also in mourning and we're mourning for so many things. It's hard to track, but grief and mourning is what we're focusing on today. I, it's clear from early data collection that COVID-19 virus is killing black and brown people in our country at far higher rates than whites. And this pandemic has highlighted the longstanding health disparities across our country, along with the inequalities in accessing healthcare. This chart indicates the disproportionality of not only the infection rate, but of the death rate as well. As we think about all the new challenges that this pandemic has posed for us all, we realize that we are definitely weathering the same storm. How many times have you heard we're all in this together since this began, right? However, the inequality of the responses, whether country to country, state to state, or neighborhood to neighborhood, the patchwork response has led to a patchwork of differing impacts. Layer onto this the patchwork of resources and access to supports and pervasive systemic inequalities, we see, we see how we're not in the same boat at all, but we're all in different boats trying to weather the same storm. Consider the old proverb of a rising tide lifts all boats. As we work toward greater equity, especially now, we can think about what we can do to support our community um, in those that are, that are in boats that are unseaworthy or perhaps not even a boat at all. And so I wanna ask that we all acknowledge what we have and what we've lost, the privilege that some of us have by naming it, by using whatever we have in ways that bring people together and create connection so that we might honor each other's humanity. An early study, and it's early, um, an early study indicates that at least 56% 56, 56 of those surveyed are experiencing pandemic-related stress and feel it's causing a negative impact on emotional well-being. This study looks at some of the reasons for this, including the absence of activities that increase esteem and pleasure and status. That is things like weddings, graduations, sports events, even work, 
dating, parenting, all that kind of stuff. And perhaps contrary to what we may experience ourselves, it appears that attending important life events over Zoom, including funerals, are what he calls artificial events and can actually increase feelings of disconnection for some folks. The research also records an increase in alcohol and substance abuse, anxiety and suicide and loneliness worldwide. These are some of the you know, extra stresses that we are dealing with. So as, I, as we move into bereavement and grief, I just want to define uh, some of these things for us so we're all on the same page. Bereavement is the objective experience of having a loved one die. That is bereavement. Grief is an emotional, physiological, cognitive, and behavioral reaction to loss. And mourning are the cultural practices and expression of grief that we have, the rituals and things that we, that we do. So we are universally experiencing an upsurge in grief and loss. The number of ways in which each one of us of our, of our lives have changed and are grieving, the change is astounding. Our sense of connection to other people appears to be the most deeply felt. We're also missing a dependable routine and familiar rituals. Our identity or sense of professional practice is impacted as we struggle to adapt to a new role, a compromised ability to help that leave us feeling ineffective. We may have lost faith in our government or in our leaders and their ability to lead, guide, and protect us. We miss our coworkers and the support that really keeps us going and reduces our isolation and vicarious trauma. We have conceptual losses as well, those of hope or freedom or peace. Do you recognize some of these things here? So a lot of these are considered non-bereavement losses. And these losses have been found to instill a similar grief reaction, especially when the loss is directly associated with one's identity. Non-bereavement losses trigger a grief reaction. And of course, there are variables that may intensify a grief reaction or that aren't necessarily accepted as grief-inducing losses. And those include high-risk situations, socioeconomic disparity, and ambiguous or unacknowledged or stigmatized losses, like divorce or incarceration, deportation, those kinds of things are all happening and we are all grieving them as well. Grief is a perfectly natural, necessary, normal, and unique to the individual response. I just want to repeat that again. Grief is perfectly natural, necessary, normal, and unique to the individual. We all grieve differently. There is no one way to experience or go through it. There is no set time it should be done. This word cloud contains the dozens of ways that we can all experience, exhibit, or process grief. They are all natural, necessary, normal, and unique. We can feel the, any one of these feelings any minute of the day and feel something completely different in the next minute. These are all really normal ways. Like the weather, grief is unpredictable and always changing. There is no map. There is no established route or formula for grief's weather pattern. It can come upon us without any kind of warning. Grief is uncomfortable. We are actually uh, neuro, uh, our neurotransmitters are wired to move us away from grief. Um, it's almost instinctual that we try to move away to avoid grief because the hurt can feel overbearing and it saps our energy for living life. It's, this is something that we need to really under, understand and recognize and forgive ourselves for that we try to avoid grief. It's just a survival mechanism uh, that our body moves us in that direction. 
grief can be competitive. That is the, you know, other people have it worse. We judge ourselves harshly feeling that I should be over it even before others who may judge you for your grief journey. And while it may be positive, a positive perspective to hold that other people have it worse than, than us, believing that they have it worse makes it competitive and diminishes the grief ache we may be feeling. Society really puts value on those who are strong. It provides the message that vulnerability is wrong and you shouldn't show it. It is a weakness to feel grief or exhibit grief. And along with that, we learn that grief is shameful. We grieve in private and in public, we apologize for crying. Finally, it is true that time does heal. It is not true that there are stages that proceed in a linear fashion. I'm sure you've all heard about Kubler-Ross's stages of, of grief work, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. These were never meant to be linear stages, but ones that can be cycled in and out of multiple times as you experience your own journey toward recovery. We can consider the impact of the COVID-19 virus similar to an event of mass violence. For many of you who've been involved in something like that, you may recognize a similarity to the collective trauma experienced by a community coming to terms with that event and the trauma response we're all subject to, including hypervigilance, fear, elevated stress response. So in the pre-disaster stage, you know, there's a warning and there's a threat and that's where we were in maybe January, February, right? And so we're listening, we're planning, we're buying supplies and toilet paper. Then there's the impact when COVID actually hit, hit our hometown. And that may be different for each of us. People knew, people we know were getting sick and schools were closing. Um, and for some people it was more remote. It really took a while to hit their communities. There's the heroic stage um, during that. We all, yes, we all hunkered down at home. We stayed home, we set up homeschooling, we stocked up on our canned goods and our toilet paper and our disinfecting wipes, and we washed our hands incessantly and we wiped down every surface we ever touched and we put on our masks. And it, it's, it was sort of heroic that we were feeling, you know, we were all in this together. We were all gonna beat this thing. And then along comes this disillusionment phase, you know, that it, as it became closer and closer to home and the, and the death toll was rising and we were, we continued to receive mixed messages from our leaders. And then there were pro, then there were some openings and some protests about the openings and more deaths were happening and more deaths were happening. Um, so we grew disillusioned with this heroic stance we were in and this, and this community cohesion that we had. And so, as, but, but what makes this different is that, um, you know, this is an ongoing crisis. This is a rolling event. And as we continue to experience this ongoing rolling event, we may continue to cycle around this impact for some time to come before we can finally enter into the reconstruction phase you see at the end and have our new beginning. So all of this can lead to sort of a complicated grief or traumatic grief and sort of looking at some of these, you know, what, what characterizes a complicated or traumatic grief or some of these things where we, we have a loss of the assumptive world. The assumptive world is, you know, that the world is, is safe and predictable and I'm not taking any risks so nothing bad can happen to me and that people are necessarily good and that I'll be okay. Um, so that's, that's the assumptive world that we tend to lose with complicated or traumatic grief. Grief can also be responsible for triggering other losses. Major mental health symptoms are what's considered a depressive grief brain, um, which is sort of a depleted and low psych psychic energy kind of expression. Another challenge for COVID-related death and how it mirrors the traumatic grief is what may be felt the meaninglessness of the loss that makes the recovery more difficult. 
Sometimes when we can ascribe some meaning to the loss of a loved one, it can soften the blow somewhat. But when there's meaningless associated, when someone didn't have to die, it makes it that much more complicated to recover from and that much more traumatic. Rage, obsessive focusing on the death of your loved one, intense feelings and longing, all are hallmarks of a complicated or traumatic grief. Those with this type of grief are more likely to engage in self-destructive behavior, use alcohol or drugs in an effort to dull the intense emotional pain they experience. So for our family members, our friends and our clients, how can you companion with them in their journey? What do they need you to do? So one, you know, one of the things that we talk about is letting the person have all their feelings. And you know, rather than trying to diminish them, minimize them, compare them, or talk them out of their sad, horrible, rageful, depressive feelings, just let them have it. Invite them to talk and follow their lead wherever they go. It's, you know, it's, they need to talk about what they need to talk about and we don't need to squelch what they're saying um, to try to make them feel better. We should avoid minimizing, reassuring. Um, we should av avoid also self-disclosure, that sort of, you know, um, shift to, oh, I know how you feel because I lost dot, 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 and start telling your own story. At times, and when that's welcome, it's, it's, it's good to share. But if you don't have a very similar loss, it can feel diminishing. For people who've lost someone to homicide, for example, hearing about your loss of your grandmother um, isn't the same kind of experience. So it doesn't provide the kind of consolation that you're trying to, to, to uh, provide. Try to avoid giving advice unless you're asked for advice and try to avoid giving cliches. Express empathy though. Say what you sense they are going through. But what I really hear you saying, what I'm really noticing, what I really feel you're feeling. And listen to behavior that's really for children because children don't have the words that, that adults have. So really, you know, thinking about what does a child need to hear? Here are some statements you can try on. Um, acknowledge the families or your, or your friends or whoever it is, your community members' feelings um, and the pain that the families are feeling. And when they open up, be sure to thank them. For example, thank you for telling me about your loved one. I hear how much she or he meant to you. If you don't know what to say, it's okay to be honest. You can affirm and reassure family, family by saying, there are no words that I can say to make this okay, but I'm here for you. Also, advocates who've served families of murder victims for many years report back, what you don't say is as important as what you do say. Listen to the silence. Stay present in hard moments by nodding, keeping open, attentive body language and breathing. It can be a good strategy to repeat back what you've heard from families so they know that you're listening and you're clear about what's important to them. It's absolutely okay if family members cry. Don't rush them out of the moment by putting Kleenex in their hand. Instead, put tissues near them so they feel permission to express emotion and know they have support. Think about how you can virtually put tissues near someone while you're online. What would that look like? The most important rule that we can follow as providers is to say only what's true. Don't ever overpromise, overcommit, or misrepresent what you can provide to families. Trust is of the utmost importance at a time when families feel out of control and don't know who they can trust. With time and practice, these caring and non-judgmental phrases will come more naturally to you if they don't already. Now, don't say these kinds of things. It was God's will that everything happens for a reason. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. I understand how you feel. You have to be strong. 
at least it's over now and you don't have to worry about them anymore. It will get easier. And closure. Closure is, is kind of a bad word because there really is no necessarily closure um, when somebody dies. There's just living with it. Things don't get closed up. You don't forget about them. I know that some homicide survivors in particular can feel very um, offended by that term because the idea that they could have closure uh, for them might mean that their loved one's life didn't mean anything, it didn't have an impact, and their death didn't mean anything and didn't have an impact. So trying to stay away from that term is a very good practice. Another good practice as providers is to, is to consider the entire family unit. Families are interdependent and each person's well-being has an impact on the entire system. Even if we're not serving each member directly, we may have referrals or resources that can benefit additional family members. It's important to not make assumptions about what mourners may need based on their age, their race, or their gender. Rather than make assumptions, ask thoughtful and open-ended questions or offer a menu of services to folks so that they know what's available. Don't probe too harshly for details about the death. Be clear about what you need to know in order to do your job. Make sure you ask about how the children are coping and remember that what's good for a one-year-old will be different than a five-year-old and a seven-year-old and a teenager. Remember the men. Don't make assumptions that men don't need emotional support. Many grief resources are geared toward women, mothers, grandmothers, and wives. Sometimes we even direct condolences or support toward female family members who may be more vocal about their pain and grief. Be intentional about making contact with the men in the family, fathers, uncles, brothers, sons, to see what they need, especially if they're more quiet and less expressive about these needs. Acknowledge and validate the pain and anger all family members are feeling be aware of unhealthy patterns that indicate someone might need additional support. Those patterns might include drug or alcohol abuse, extreme weight loss or weight gain, and extreme withdrawal from community. Remember the services we provide must be consensual, and also it is important to be honest with clients when we notice behaviors that may be self-harming. What else helps are traumatic grief groups, community groups, language access, victim compensation, and culturally relevant healing traditions. Keep those in mind as you continue on this helping journey as well as we can behind our screens. So let's shift our focus back to you now. You've seen this before, right? It's the Chinese symbol for crisis. It's made up of two characters. One represents danger and one represents opportunity. There's no doubt that while we're in the middle of mourning all we've lost in adapting to this evolving reality, we can appreciate those things that we have in a different way. Let's take a look at what the opportunities for victim services work are that are coming out of this crisis. Some of those opportunities we now may have may be extra time saved from not having to have a commute and spending, being able to spend that extra time with yourself or with your family members. We found new ways of connecting during the pandemic, ways that we may, have, that we may not have thought as possible. Technology, when accessible and functional, has helped all of us in so many ways, from individual sessions for advocacy and counseling, for team meetings, for social time with coworkers and friends, and time to share important moments as well. Using the language, physically distanced, socially connected, reminds us that we don't have to be isolated. You know, the term has really been socially distant, but I like the idea of being physically distant and socially connected instead. We don't have to be isolated. We can reach out virtually or even with a phone call. Remember phone calls? I'm sure that you too wanna to mix up phone and web-based meetings. Thinking about all of the traumatic events of recent months, both the pandemic and the racial justice movement in response to the, to the deaths of African-American citizens, along with our own additional traumatic experiences, it can be useful to remember the wise words of Dr. Judith Lewis Herman, Quote, 
helplessness and isolation are the core experiences of trauma. Power and reconnection are the core experiences of recovery. Power and reconnection are the core experiences of recovery. These are some of the strategies you told us about in your registration. And there were a lot, I so appreciate the time you took to answer that question. Uh, you really had a, a wide variety of things that you were doing. Friends was first and foremost, as you can see right there. Talk was a close second. Family was a, th was a third. But you're doing all kinds of things. You're involved in hobbies. You're reading. You're watching TV. Your faith is, is giving you support um, and is a strategy you're relying on heavily. Exercise, uh, breathing, socializing, talking with your coworkers, making new recipes as a, as a new hobby for some of you, practicing mindfulness, and going outside is so important. Being in nature, making sure you get out of the house to the extent that you can and being around some green is really critically important, particularly for those of us who live in colder climates, taking advantage of this summer weather while we can because uh, winter's a coming and uh, we're, we're gonna be inside more than we might, uh, might want to be. So I urge you to um, get some ideas off of this if you can't think of any yourself. I love the people who, who rely on their pets. And I, I love that, you know, some people love to snuggle. Some people love to sing. Uh, it really a beautiful uh, list of things to do. And uh, right down there at the bottom, planning future. Planning future vacation, planning future uh, living uh, is, is, you know, we, we do have a future. We do have, you know, things to look forward to. And um, don't forget that. And you can plan for it. Now's the time. My favorite strategy somebody wrote in was look at the donut, not the, hall, not the hole. I love this because it speaks to appreciating what we have and not giving attention to the things that aren't there. So it's being grateful for what we have, looking at the donut and not the hole. I'm, gonna, I'm stealing that and using it a lot now. <laughs> so remembering the big picture and taking perspective, that can be the donut and not the hole, right? Um, the losses that we've experienced during the pandemic can provide us the opportunity to reflect on our values, on what's important to us. The world is so much bigger than we ourselves. Our lives do not begin or end with one day. And this day may go well or not. But holding that perspective, that today is one of many, can be so helpful. Remembering that we are part of the victim's movement one part making a difference through our work and our lives. So taking the long view, maintaining perspective, and staying grounded in why we do the work and is, is particularly important at this time. Work-life balance. You've been, I'll read you the, um, you've been working Awfully hard lately. If you need a little fresh air and sunshine, go to www.freshhairandsunshine.com. Of course, I'm joking. Please don't do that. One of the biggest challenges for advocates, even in the best of times, is finding a work-life balance. One in which your energies are spent, not in equal measure necessarily, but in a measure that is satisfying for you. While some of us were able to draw that bright line between work and home, Others, because of the nature of crisis work, may have had to have been on call or providing backup to their 24-7 agency operations. Back in the good old days of going to an office or going on home visits, doing outreach in the community, perhaps we use the delineation of our commute to mark the beginning and end of our workday. Perhaps we took an actual lunch break with coworkers to check in on non-work stuff. 
Perhaps it was coming home and walking the dog or tending to kids that made that line. So this is something that, that is really necessary for you to make this delineation between work and home. Oops, sorry, I went ahead too far. So there was work and there was home and now they're merged and our former strategies don't apply. We are literally bringing the trauma of our victims and survivors into our homes. A work-life balance has always been a challenge and now it's even harder. So as, as we've been adapting and working from home, what have you found that makes work-life balance definition? Setting boundaries has always been important and we're now challenged to devise new ways to maintain our boundaries. There's one major advantage that being an advocate provides you, your experience and training in crisis response. Again, I wanna remind you to lean into those skills that you use every day on the job for yourself. Practice some of the grounding techniques that you use to support survivors and hold on to the notion that you are an expert in responding to crisis and use all that training for yourself and your loved ones. So self-care. Self-care, we hear a lot about self-care and self-care is critically important. It's not the whole story, but it, but it is a critically important thing to, to pay attention to. So this definition of self-care um, comes from the World Health Organization. And if you see, it's pretty basic. Um, it really has to do with hygiene. It has to do with nutrition. It has to do with your lifestyle, environmental factors, socioeconomic factors, and self-medication. Self-care doesn't necessarily mean a weekly massage or bubble baths or, you know, sort of extra um, putting, putting more and more stuff on your plate so you can do self-care. Sometimes self-care is saying no. Sometimes self-care is taking stuff off your plate. Sometimes self-care is just being able to take an evening off of doing something that somebody wants you to do. So these are the things, so the things that the World Health Organization spearheads here are, are things that what humans need to do to live, activities that vary by culture, geography, personality, and socioeconomics, age, but consider how much more those who are traumatized and those who work with them for their own sustenance. This, this all goes beyond self-care, although caring for yourself is a good place to start. Audre Lorde says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. One of the things that you can do is um, a media diet. It's like drinking out of a fire hose these days. Between the pandemic, the civil and equity rights protests, and the national election, there's so much to keep up with. Putting some boundaries around your news diet is really important. Knowing when it is enough to inform but not inflame you, or allowing it to inflame you as long as it motivates you to action to dispel some of the energy that it creates. A study from a psychological researchers out of Hofstra University recommend that in order to manage anxiety, if that's what you're feeling, that only one hour of news per day, if at all, with no television news at all. How about that? See if you can do that. So, and of course, Pay attention to your physical health above all. Make sure you're eating well, you are exercising a little bit each day, sleeping well, you're taking time away from work, you're closing your computer at the end of the day, or whatever it is you need to do to bring an end to your work day. Eating healthy foods, spending time with loved ones, but dispelling some of that energy that, you know, working in front of a computer all day is really different from how we used to work when we were in an office, when we could pass by our coworkers, when we get up and take walks around the office. Um, so take those, take those walks around your home or your neighborhood if you can during the day. Being attuned to our bodies and grounded serves to help us respond to our own needs and those around us. Psychologist Michelle Newman at Penn State University who researches anxiety offers this helpful information. 
that negative thoughts and worries are anxiety of the mind and tension is how anxiety manifests in the body. Becoming attuned to our physical and emotional selves is a practice that's worth the effort. When our bodies are stressed, we have little control over our autonomic response, our heart beats fast, our muscle, muscles are tense, and our, our breathing is shallow. The one major system in our body that we can control is our breath. So when we bring attention to our breath and we slow down our breath, that helps to slow down our heart rate, slow down the muscle tension, slow down our racing thoughts. So practicing deep breathing, slow breathing, not just when you're stressed, but even when you're relaxed, every time you remember it during the day is good practice to get your body used to slowing down and relaxing when you need to. Sometimes our body does it for us when we take a big uh, deep breath when we're feeling overwhelmed with something. Um, and uh, we go, <sighs> We have a heavy sigh. That is your body saying, I need to calm right down here. Practicing gratitude, I'm sure you've heard, is, is uh, actually research-based practice that um, does wonders for your mental health. It keeps, it keeps your focus on the donut and not the hole, for example. Um, a regular gratitude journaling practice um, is, is really helpful and it, the research shows that the effects of a regular practice aren't just in the moment that you're writing or for the day that you're writing, but it actually lasts over several days or weeks when you do practice writing. I keep a, a, a gratitude journal that I write in, in, in at, at the end of the day. My colleague Lisa writes, writes in hers first thing in, in the morning. And you know I'll write in it several days in a row and then I won't for several days in a row. And sometimes I get in a really you know cranky place and I'm not writing in it for a really long time. And I realize, oh my gosh, I'm in this, how do I get out of this space that I'm in? And I can't think of anything that I wanna write. So then I just read it. I go back and I read some of the things I wrote and instantly it lifts me out of my mood. So I really recommend that you spend a little time journaling. What am I grateful for right now? And rather than writing a list of what you're grateful for, spend, you know, five minutes writing full sentences about what you're grateful for. Research confirms for us how vital relationships and social support are as for us as humans, as victim service workers, as community members. We know that isolation for victims can be literally deadly. So this is not something that we need to um, give up on for ourselves. Staying connected to those people who love us, that care about us, that support us, um, are all critically important. Um, so being available, listening to your people, they'll listen back for you, stay steady with them, avoid judgment with them. This is all ways that you can be a support to your relationships and they can be a support to you. Some cognitive strategies that we can use as well are those, you know, sort of getting, getting out of your, your worried mind, your monkey mind, your, you know, your, your, your tensed up body, and choose to focus on what you can control. What can I take care of right now? Ask yourself, is what I'm focusing on helpful or not? Am I just worrying about something that I don't have any control over? Is there, is there something about what I'm focusing on is, that's gonna change the situation, that will help the situation? If not, then refocus. What will help the situation? What can you control? What do you have control over? Set realistic expectations for your work, for how much you can get done in a day, how much you are able to provide uh, in, in a day that it doesn't deplete you and leave, leave nothing left for you at the end of the day or for your loved ones at the end of the day. Setting limits on your time at work. There are all kinds of ways that you can set limits, um, not just on the time, but on the energy uh, and the worry and the concern that you expel uh, on uh, your work and for your loved ones.
holding hope. Remember, this is one of those, one of the losses that, that is, that we're all feeling right now, maybe uh, in and out of feeling hopeful or hopeless. Um, consider how you have held hope for your clients and your families and even your staff members. Sometimes we can be called upon to see the light at the end of the tunnel, a positive outcome, even when others can't see it. And given the kind of work that we all do, we need to find ways to bolster that hope. Optimism, having a sense of humor go a long way in carrying us through. Focusing in on the positive, on the possible, on the strength can also strengthen our neural pathways to feel more optimistic. At this time of loss and COVID, being grateful can be particularly difficult yet it is one of the ways that researchers are finding that we can be buoyed and restores our sense of hope. We found these uh, daily questions recently and I wanted to share this one. Uh, it comes from the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California in Berkeley. If you don't know about that, uh, that's, they have tremendous resources on scientifically proven effective ways to, uh, to provide a better, grateful, more optimistic disposition. So I encourage you to check out the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California in Berkeley. And what they recommend is, you know, just silently at the end of every day, looking over these questions and answering for them answering them for yourself. What am I grateful for today? Who am I checking in on or connecting with today? What expectations of normal am I letting go of today? How am I getting outside today? How am I moving my body today? What beauty am I creating, cultivating, or inviting today? Keeping these questions in front of you can help, really help keep you grounded and make sure that you don't get sucked up into the world of caring for others and, and forgetting all about yourself. These are really important strategies just to keep in front of you as a suggestion um, to help you take care of yourself as you move throughout your day. So that's what I have for you today. And, um, I guess we're gonna move into questions now from the um, Q&A. Um, so I would welcome whatever questions there that might've popped in. So um, <clears throat> this is Deidre. So Catherine, we have a question from Marsha. It says, my friend passed and her husband is talking back and forth to her between their two Facebook pages. He responded to something I posted using her as responding to me, and it kind of tripped me out. Is what he is doing healthy for him? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand it. Could you read it again? Sure. My friend passed, and her husband is talking back and forth to her between their two Facebook pages. Okay. He responded to something I posted using her as responding to me uh, and it kind of tripped me out is what oh, he is yeah. doing healthy for him oh dear um well healthy for him i suppose you know we, we're really not in a place to judge that he's doing what he needs to do um and um and maybe he thinks he's doing you a favor by responding in her voice um, so you don't forget her. Um, he may have all kinds of reasons for doing that. And maybe if you have a conversation and, and be curious about it um, um, would be helpful. But I, I, imagine, I imagine that must have been very jarring for you um, to see that. And, uh, and, and perhaps you could share that with him. Um, that, and, and just be curious about whether he, he finds it, how he finds that helpful for himself. Catherine, can we go back one slide? I, we had a few folks who were trying to write down the questions oh. to ask ourselves, <laughs> of course. and they would like to see them again. Okay, let's see. Uh, uh, somehow I'm not able to do it. Oh. Are you able to, you want to, oh, there, did I do okay. it? Okay, good, sorry. Okay, phew. All right. Okay. Um, so as people write down those questions, here's another question that we have. Um, 
do you think that as the weather gets cooler that it will be harder to self-care it's a it's a concern right um as the weather gets cooler we we might be you know safely um you know physically distancing ourselves from from social in social situations people are you know having backyard gatherings and seeing family members for the first time as we're coming out of quarantine and spending some time with them outdoors and it's life-giving to be with people physically rather than seeing them uh just through the screen all the time so i i really encourage you to be able to con continue that in whatever way you can um but there you know you will really need to figure out other ways to take care of yourself if going outside is no longer an option mm -hmm. if the weather is is so bad that you you know if you can meet somebody for a quick walk or something like that, that might be great. Um, but figuring out creative ways to stay in touch with people um, and other ways to take care of yourself so you can get outside. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for another question. So this one reads, I've always been told that I have to be strong for everyone. Mm -hmm. When my friend died, I bawled with her husband bald, crying um, with her husband. This is the first time that I have ever done this and felt guilt because I felt I was supposed to be strong for him. Was it wrong for me to do this? No, no. I bet he felt so accompanied that he had someone that he could actually ball with himself that, um, you know, that you were so de devastated. It's, it's, it's real. It's honest. It's an emotion. You know, it's, it's, that was how you were feeling. I think that we do ourselves a disservice by thinking that we need to stay strong for other people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can, it can come across as uncaring or unfeeling. Sometimes it can feel, well, that person's not crying. I, I must be in so much worse shape because I'm not as strong as that person, but you don't know what that person is doing behind closed doors. So it is perfectly acceptable to show your sadness, to show your grief, to, to cry with, with your loved ones um, about these real losses. Uh, they're devastating. And um, we're only human and we need to, to allow our humanity. Um, so I'm, I'm terribly sorry about the loss of your friend. Um, and uh, that must have been so devastating for you. And I'm glad you had the opportunity to be there with her husband. Um, let's see, we've got another question. Um, do people get stuck in grief? So, so that, that's definitely a fear a lot of people have, or it can be a judgment by somebody else that, that someone is stuck in grief. Um, for those who have never really had the experience of grieving somebody very close to them, it can look like somebody who, who, you know, is, loses a spouse or loses a child or, you know, may be stuck in their grief because their grief is so long enduring. Um, but it, it really, it, you know, grief is a process and you have to go through the process. You can't skip over it. If, if you try to skip over it, it's going to come back and get you some, in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. So allowing yourself to go through the process and um, doing what you need to do to process it, whether it's, you know, talking with friends and family, whether it's uh, seeing a counselor, whether it's joining grief groups, those are all really positive mechanisms. Um, getting involved in a cause in your loved one's name, um, those are all really positive ways of moving through your grief. Um, and, and, you know, but I, I, I don't worry too much about people getting stuck in their grief. Good. Um, here's one. Any self-care tips for men? Trying to find resources for men who do not tend to express emotions. Yeah, men are tough, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and talk about having to be strong. I mean, often, you know, men are really forgotten. It's, it's when, when a family member di dies, you know, the men will be approached and, and they'll ask, you know, how's your wife doing? Uh, they won't ask, how are you doing? They'll say, how's your wife doing? And the men, you know, they, they go back to work earlier than women do. They don't show their emotions the way women do. So they're really, you know, they're at a disadvantage. Um, in terms of resources, I think it's, you know, it, the resources is just telling them about how normal it is, is to grieve and allowing them their feelings and encouraging their feelings and following their lead. Um, and, uh, you know, telling them that they don't have to be strong. Um, 
is is really important. Um, men's grief groups are very effective if you if you can find any. Um, they're really good because men can really encourage men to to cry or therapy, of course, as well. Um, but yeah. Yeah, um, and so this question says, would it be possible to apply this to kids who are grieving too? Oh, absolutely, yeah, and, and kids grieve differently. Um, you know, kids, they show it in their body, and, you know, one minute a, a kid might be, you know, grieving the loss of a parent or sibling or whomever, and, you know, be, be exhibiting it like a, like a grown-up, you know, crying and, and expressing sadness. And the next minute they're playing with their Legos. And so you think, oh, well, they're fine. I guess they're not really that badly affected. And then the next thing you know, they're having a tantrum about something. And then the next thing you know, that they're refusing to go to bed. And the next thing you know, you know, so they show it in all kinds of different ways. They have tummy aches, they have headaches. Um, they, they don't want to go places. They, they, you know, can't sleep well. They don't want to be alone. You know, there are all kinds of ways that children exhibit grief um, the, differently than adults do because they don't have the words. Um, and they, and they can experience it in d different developmental stages as they move through their life, you know, missing, missing a parent or a friend or a, 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 you know, uh, at different stages of their life where that will come back and remind them that, you know, their sibling isn't there, their mother isn't there. So we are right at time. So we are going to stop for the day. There are about 13 questions. We know we have definitely seen them that we've not been able to get to, but as we promised, we will be sending those over to Catherine. She will answer them and we will send all participants her responses. Um, in addition, I've seen multiple requests come through. We have been recording this presentation. So we will make it available to all of the attendees, um, which will include the slides as well. And finally, I've seen this question popping up quite a bit. Do we offer CEUs? We do not, but everybody who attended will be getting confirmation of attendance. So I believe that will answer everything that I saw in the chat that kept coming up. We'll make sure to share this information as soon as we get it ready. Thank you all again so much for joining us today. And thank you, Catherine, for, for giving this. I'm watching the chats go. Um, yes. and there's a lot of instant feedback just saying this was one of the better webinars, mm -hmm. helpful information. So thank you so much for joining us. Good. I'm glad it was yeah. helpful. And, um, you know, thank you all for the work that you do. And uh, please do take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And it was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Okay. I didn't want to, I was, I was afraid to talk. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> I was afraid to talk. I got too sick.